This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is the uh, 2008 Hitchcock Professor at Berkeley. Leon Letterman is an internationally renowned uh, scientist for his work on neutrinos, ghost-like particles that pass through everything in the universe. Among his many honors are the Wolf Prize in Physics in 1982, and in 1988, along with Melville, Melvin Schwartz and Jack Steinberger, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of the muon neutrino, proving there are at least two families of neutrinos. He's a founder and resident scholar at the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, director emeritus of the Fermi Lab, and Pritzker, Professor of Science at the Illinois Institute of Technology. For many years, he was the Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics at Columbia, and then the Frank Sulzberger Professor of Physics at the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Letterman, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? New York City. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, um, well, fundamentally, I think they had a big role in this because they were hardworking. Uh, they were free thinkers. Uh, my father uh, varied in his political leanings depending on who was doing what and who was saying what. So he would, he wasn't rigid in all of this, and uh, uh, both of them were intensely uh, interested in education, especially my education. Uh, we lived uh, within uh, about two or three hundred yards from a high school. I remember asking my parents about uh, the possibility. At that time, Bronx High School of Science, famous school, didn't exist. But there was uh, the best high school in New York City was Stuyvesant. It's still a great high school. And I asked my mother about the possibility of my going to Stuyvesant. And her answer was, can you walk to Stuyvesant? And I said, oh, no, you have to take a subway. Mm -hmm. She says, well, you can walk to this high school. We live near. We moved here so that you can walk to high school. It's James Monroe High School, and that's where you're going, and that's where I went. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was a, an exciting time to be in New York City and then the, the important role that, that science was playing as a result of World War II and after. I, I'm very curious about how you were drawn in as a high school kid, uh, a young person, into the culture of, of science, basically. So what, what were the formative early experiences that got you well, interested? Well, it was a class. The classes were uh, taught by extremely competent teachers. and. Uh, uh, that that was the drawing feature is that uh, I took uh, first I was fascinated by chemistry and uh, drawn into that and uh, there was a young man who was uh, uh, working his way through night school but he worked in the laboratory with glassware and taught me how to blow glass and uh, shape the various uh, devices that you need to make in order to filter and precipitate various Thing. So I was charmed by the chemistry initially and the teaching of chemistry by the, by the high school teacher. And then uh, a little bit later, uh, physics. And uh, when I was uh, absolutely overwhelmed by the, by the lectures we had in physics. Uh, this is in high school now, or you this are is all in, in high school? school. Yeah. 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 And. Uh, so that the, the, the high school experience was first rate. And you know, there was also writing uh, exercises and creative writing. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, going into a class of creative writers and 
uh, where the teacher would tell us uh, how to, you know, organize words and expressions into something which is a little different from uh, standard uh, expressions. All of, so I had a good education, and uh, our fellow students were part of that education. You know, we talked to each other about the schoolwork very often and uh, argued politics and things like that. What was the, the, the attitude toward science at that time better than it is today, uh, and therefore it, 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 there, there was a heroic quality to being a scientist? I'm not sure we could have defined attitude. Yeah. <laughs> but really, uh, it was one of the subjects, and mm -hmm. it, we didn't have a, a yes or a no opinion. Science was um, interesting, sometimes uh, difficult, sometimes too easy. Uh, we took it as it was given to us. We were not aware of the, of the crucial role that science played in society. I mean, uh, in, in school at that time, and unfortunately too often today, uh, you spent most of your time on the content of science, but not on the, the significance of it, the process of science, who becomes a scientist. We didn't think of ourselves as becoming scientists. We were interested in science because it was, uh, the laboratory work was fascinating and every once in a while something would go kaboom and that was exciting. <laughs> were you a tinkerer? Did you like to do yes, experiments? Yeah. Yes, actually I had an older brother who later turned out to be a high school dropout but he was, he had magic hands. He could do things with his hands. He could make things and my greatest joy was in watching him and so when it came to the uh, household chores, I would do mine and I would do his uh, just because if I did his chores, he would let me watch him <laughs> in the basement working with chemicals and stuff he got from the drugstore and s occasionally a chemistry O3 or some set of chemical uh, experiments. He loved to tinker in that way and I loved to watch him. Where did you do your undergraduate work, and then where, where do you, uh, what year was that? Well, I started, uh, let's see, uh, City College of New York and uh, in 39, graduated in 43, so that was my four years of City College. And City College was av available by streetcar <laughs> for my house, uh, changing uh, twice. You were old enough to get on the subway. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it wasn't the subway. It was, a, it was the surface transportation. Mm -hmm. And then it, service in the military? Uh, well, that came later. The, the, um, uh, I uh, was inducted into the Army in 43, uh, almost didn't graduate, uh, and was in the Army for three years. And then uh, graduate work. Where did you do your graduate work? Uh, I did my graduate work at, at uh, Columbia. I got into Columbia University when I was discharged from the Army. First thing I did was to uh, uh, register as a, uh, as a physics major. I had uh, switched interest from chemistry to physics somewhere in the, in the interim. I thought... Uh, uh, physics was more challenging and in fact in many ways simpler than chemistry. It didn't have the smells and it didn't have the, <laughs> the tribulations of uh, sweeping up the materials you dropped on the floor and getting the wrong answer on the analysis of what mysterious stuff was there. But physics uh, was, was a challenge and, and that was when I really uh, thought about a uh, career in science. And uh, at, uh, in graduate school, who, who were any particular professors who mentored you, or became your, and, and who became your your dissertation advisor, and so on? Um, well, let's see. Um, the the physics department at Columbia was chaired by Isidore Isaac Robby, one of the founders of American physics. Uh, he on the East Coast and Robert Oppenheimer on the West Coast really started uh, the American schools of physics. And they were helped by lots of immigration. And in fact, at uh, Columbia, um, uh, Robbie had invited 
um, a particular rather uh, well-known cosmic ray expert by the name of uh, Gilberto Bernardini. And uh, so I tell a lot of stories about Gilberto because uh, he came from Italy with a rather uh, severe wartime experience and we got to know each other. And uh, his uh, command of English was limited, uh, but enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got to be uh, a very friendly, and I think he was a, a, a major element in my education because he had been an experienced cosmic ray scientist and uh, knew, the, knew how to do research. And, and, but he was also different. He was uh, so different from the Anglo-Saxon professors I had. Uh, he, uh, he was um, uh, passionate and excitable. And uh, the thing he taught me that I think was uh, most, most important was the, his sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd walk into a room and push the light button, the lights would go on, he'd say, Fantastico! <laughs> That's Italian. Mm -hmm. It means fantastic. <laughs> and uh, then he would turn the lights off and turn them on again, turn them off, turn them on again. He was amazed by simple things. Like, you know, if you asked him how did it happen, he, well, he would say behind the switch, there's a contact, and the contact closes a circuit, and somewhere a hundred mm -hmm. miles away, water is falling on a wheel and turning and making the electricity. He would know all that, but for him, the idea that this is a button on the wall and you push it and the lights go on was a miracle. And so never tired of s being uh, awed by simple things. And, and that's really something that you picked up. And I guess uh, th that's an important ingredient in being a scientist, uh, uh, maintaining that. I think it's, it, it's crucial. I mean, this sense of wonder and the sense of understanding something after working at it a long time, or the sense of discovering how something works when, when you first look at it, it's total mystery. Uh, you know, you can make a, a discovery as a scientist, uh, 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 an important discovery once in a lifetime, maybe two or three times if you're very, very fortunate and very clever. But um, the daily uh, process of doing science has to bring you some satisfaction too. You just can't wait for the discovery and wait for, for the fame and so on. Uh, you have to enjoy the day-to-day -day activities in some sense. And that's what I learned from Bernardini. And, and let, let's uh, uh, explore that some more. I, 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 an important component in, 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 in the culture and the attitudes of a scientist is really being very curious, wanting to know what is this made of? How does it work? Well, you know, there's a list of uh, a list of um, qualities that go into science, and one of them is curiosity. Another one is open-mindedness. But as somebody wisecracked, not so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and then and then the the pursuit of uh, answers to questions. If you're curious, you want to know why this happened. Uh, you've got to uh, take some joy in the day-to-day -day processes. Uh, most of the time, you're you're uh, developing tools. And I'm gonna, I was more interested in experimental science than in theoretical science, and so. Uh, being familiar with tools and getting them to work was part of the part of the the, the daily grind. A, a lot of frustration in that daily grind. Oh sure, sure. Things break. Uh, things break. They don't work. Uh, you make stupid mistakes. Uh, uh, your elbow knocks over a flask that took you of something. <laughs> some gook that <laughs> you shouldn't have dropped. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, disappointments that go into science, you know, especially if you're, you're kind of clumsy, and I was probably among the more clumsy of experimental scientists. There, there seems to be this interplay 
uh, as, as you become socialized into science of, of knowing where the work is, where the important problems are. Uh, so developing experience in that regard uh, and, and on the other hand being creative and sort of looking at something anew. T talk a little about that tension between experience and creativity. Oh, it's tough. It's tough. Creativity is something we, we talk a lot about, uh, especially in the search for graduate students or even uh, in your dealing with uh, high school students and so on. Creativity is a property. You wish you had this uh, kind of uh, magic paper. You put it to the tongue of the student and if it turns orange, he's creative. But there's no measurement of creativity. You can find kids who are excellent at solving problems. They can do all the problems in the back of the book. Uh, they can get good grades on exams. But creativity is a more subtle thing. That, that, it's very hard to predict creativity unless you spend a lot of time with a student and you begin to see uh, how the student's mind works when it comes to certain problems. And when the student says something that you don't understand, and little by little, you grasp what the student is getting at, and even though his articulation may be poor, you suddenly see he is thinking, he's got an idea, and he, he or she <laughs> may be creative. Uh, creativity is, is, is a subtle thing, and of course, uh, in your own uh, uh, pursuit of, uh, of science, uh, sometimes you'll wake up at three in the morning with an idea, and uh, then you want to record it. You might forget it. Uh, is it a good idea? Well, we'll see what it looks like in the morning. Sometimes you get an idea and you don't want to even think about the idea because more often than not, the idea you think is good turns out to be a flop. As soon as you explain it to your colleague or your professor or someone, they say, oh, that doesn't work. And more often than not, that's what happens with ideas. But from time to time, the idea will live and uh, you get more courage about it with time and eventually you have enough nerve to broach it to your colleagues and they will of course start throwing blackboard erasers at you and chalk <laughs> and saying that's crazy get away but you stick with it and ultimately you can sell it and then suddenly your team has a has a pursuit that's very interesting and and so so what I'm hearing you say is a is a also another tension between self confidence and arrogance and being comfortable with your own ideas, running with them. But then on the other hand, working with teams to move the idea forward. That's that's uh, that's crucial. I mean, in this, uh, in especially in experimental science, where you you really have to uh, work with people. Uh, a, to, uh, to get uh, financial support, B, to get equipment together, C, just the, the sheer effort of getting an experiment together requires collaboration. So collaborative research is how I grew up, really, is being crucial is to, is to get, a, get uh, people to work with you, uh, whether they're students or colleagues, uh, usually both. Uh, is, is a, a, an important part of the whole issue. That means you have to be convincing. You know, I've got an idea, oh, come on. Uh, but you keep persisting and eventually uh, you get a discussion going and maybe they'll say, yeah, yeah, it is a good idea. Or they'll say, it would be a good idea, but you forgot the following you know, principle. And so you, you, that interaction with your colleagues is a very important part of science. You, you focused in your work on particle physics. Uh, uh, how did you come to that field? And, and help us understand what it is and why it's important. Well, I must say that uh, uh, we're now talking 1950, and particle physics was a new subject in some sense. And uh, we didn't know we were breaking in a new subject, but we were working with the properties uh, of, uh, of matter, you know, you, uh, you look at a uh, uh, piece of wood and then you, you can splinter it and you 
begin to realize uh, the chemical composition and then you go beyond the chemical composition of the material into uh, detailed properties. We were, uh, we were in a field in which um, uh, the atom was an old story. Uh, the atomic physics was thriving, but we knew the properties of atoms. But there were other things that happened uh, that had to do with uh, production of energy and mostly in machines. Uh, so there were uh, particle accelerators. We had a, a Columbia, uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Robbie, uh, built what at that time was one of the world's most powerful uh, the newspapers call it an atom smasher. We keep saying, we don't smash atoms, we love atoms. But this was, <laughs> this was a, a way of generating a lot of energy in a small space. And because of that energy, particles would appear via Einstein's famous equation, E, e equals mc squared. Energy and mass were connected. And by producing a lot of energy with this machine, we could create new masses and study those masses and begin to get a, a, a vision and an understanding of the microstructure of matter. In other words, what's inside is the, the key thing. So uh, what's inside uh, the atom? Well, there's a nucleus. And then there are electrons on the outside. What's inside the nucleus? Well, there are protons and neutrons. And we continue that process. It was called reductionist, if you like. We wanted to reduce the properties of matter to their simplest uh, forms and then see how these simple forms combine to make the more complicated things, which we recognize as uh, you know, quantitative matter. And, uh, and uh, again, it's a combination of, of energy and imagination. Sprinkle, sprinkled with a little bit of good luck, and all of a sudden you found a particle that nobody knew existed. And, and ultimately this, this really moves into cosmology to, to, to answer questions about how, how it all came into being. Well, that's a, that's a good statement because, in fact, today uh, we have a new subject. It's called particle astrophysics. The, it turns out that uh, our study of... Uh, the structure of matter turned out to be crucial to the uh, larger picture of the structure of the universe. You know, the uh, planets we knew about because we live on one and so we were experienced, but then there were galaxies and a thousand, millions of, uh, of suns, each sun having a, its share of, of, uh, of planets around them. And so the two subjects, uh, in fact, turned out to be very closely related. And when I became director of Fermilab, the first thing I did was to uh, create a group of astrophysicists, even though the lab itself uh, uh, was the repository of one of the largest accelerators in the world. And that accelerator is like a big microscope, so you can look at the small. But at the same time, we knew that uh, if you're going to try to understand the cosmos, you have to have a good knowledge of, of the fundamental structure. So particles in cosmology became uh, a unified uh, quest. Very exciting and still is. Uh, help us understand what you and your colleagues got the Nobel Prize for. Uh, can you, uh, if I sit here and introduce you and say that you did important work with neutrinos, you know, people out there are scratching their head and so on. Well, so, it's, a, it's a bit of a story, but um, uh, one of the, uh, we knew, we, you know, cataloged uh, the various particles. And an electron was an important particle. It had an electric charge. Uh, it had a certain mass. We measured the properties of the electron in great detail that was discovered in 1890-something, and uh, the properties of the electron were beat upon for the next 100 years to know more and more about it. We then also discovered uh, radioactivity and the processes by which spontaneously particles would explode and give rise to 
lesser mass particles, and one of those uh, particles was a neutrino. It was named, of course, by uh, Enrico Fermi, you know, because he, it had an Italian sound, neutrino, <laughs> neutrino. Uh, it, it literally is a small neutral one. And these, the neutrinos were um, produced in radioactivity. And uh, then uh, it turned out that there was a puzzle in the properties of the neutrino that we thought was pretty well understood. Wherever you had radioactivity, you had the emission of neutrinos. And then we uh, actually, um, at that time, in looking at some of these processes, were very puzzled. And eventually, the puzzle was clarified by the assumption that there are two different kinds of neutrinos. One kind related closely to the electron, and the other kind, and that was the new thing, related to uh, a cousin of the electron called a muon. And so our prize was given for the discovery of the muon neutrino. And uh, so there were two families of neutrinos, one related to the electron, one related to the muon, which is a heavy cousin of the electron. Now we know, uh, had we known then, maybe they wouldn't have given us the prize, that there were in fact three kinds of neutrinos. There's one related to the electron, one related to the muon, and one related to the tau. Never mind. <laughs> you don't want to go into that much detail. But uh, it, we, we essentially um, clarified uh, the, the, the structure of neutrinos uh, by means of this muon-type neutrino. And that involved using the, the most powerful accelerator uh, and um, uh, producing essentially a stream of radioactivity and a wall about 20 feet thick, which stopped all radioactivity except neutrinos, which were very penetrating. We know, for example, that right now we're sitting here, and uh, somewhere, if it's uh, after 10 o'clock at night, there are neutrinos coming from the sun, which is on the other side of the planet Earth, and pouring through the Earth, very penetrating, coming through us and then going on off somewhere. Uh, so the electron neutrino properties were sort of known, and then now we had another kind of neutrino, which we call the muon neutrino, which uh, in all of its reactions was associated with this muon-type particle. So this, that structure became clear as a result of our experiments, and the King of Sweden was very curious about this and sent for us, and uh, it was a great party. I recommend it highly. This is the Nobel Prize now. Yes, that's right. And, and I think I read somewhere that you said that you you had uh, Swedish holy water sprinkled That's on you. That's uh, another you, way of talking yeah. about it. Uh, uh, I'm curious, how, how long was the experiment uh, in preparation? I mean, what, what was the lead up time to actually saying we need to do this and then implementing the... Uh, yeah, I think it was a couple of years. So this was uh, 59 to 61, we did the experiment and uh, uh, by 61, we had uh, clarified this, and uh, but the uh, the committee is our slow readers, so uh, <laughs> and there are so many good things happening in science in those days uh, that it took uh, it took to uh, 80, I guess 88 when mm -hmm. we were actually awarded the prize and had our trip to Sweden. And, and so uh, you do the experiment, and then is there like a wow moment at, at that time? What talk about you know the the fruits of of your labor and uh, your experiencing? Is it a moment, or does it take well, longer it's a, it's to series, analyze the yeah. data? Yeah, it's a series of moments. You you set up the equipment, and uh, in this particular case, and you wait. And I remember once about, it usually happens at 3 in the morning or something like that, you're watching the apparatus and suddenly the apparatus is telling you something happened. And you look at the data and you see that uh, 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 a particle uh, appears and 
makes a, a collision and out of that collision comes some energy and the energy goes a certain distance and then stops and when you analyze that the only thing it could be is a neutrino type particle which disintegrated and gave rise to a muon rather than an electron so this was whereas all the neutrinos before this were related to electrons mm. we had succeeded in making a stream of different kinds of neutrinos which were related to the muon so that was you know we checked this and rechecked it and rechecked it and finally we were convinced that this was a different kind of mu neutrino and uh, we announced it and published it and uh, gave a lot of talks all over the place this was in the early 60s and then went on to many many other kinds of experiments but uh, eventually the Nobel committee um, uh, came to this particular discovery a lot of uh, Nobel prizes really require more information than just the experiment that uh, makes the discovery it has to be in a context mm -hmm. and what what happened was a structure of fundamental particles was beginning to take shape and knowing the the existence of a muon neutrino was crucial to building that structure mm -hmm. and so that's when the the prize was awarded and, and so that that it's 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 in part it's not just the recognition of the nobel but it's the the recognition over time of the fellow scientists of what you have done that's right it was it was it fit into a pattern and the pattern became uh, clarified by that experiment as you know so now now being able to do this obviously required these accelerators which in a way were uh, a major investment by the government presumably and also uh, by Columbia University so so talk a little about that because uh, in this recent period there has been a decline of that commitment uh, to funding big science uh, but that was not the case when when you were able to do this well um, I think I think there's a pattern I mean the the structure of elementary particles is now uh, very largely uh, understood it's called the standard model and uh, so you, you make a it's a little bit like uh, in chemistry there is something that decorates the walls of all the chemistry uh, 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 classes uh, around the planet and that's called the periodic table of the elements so you have hydrogen here and helium here and you have all the uh, hundred or so chemical elements and knowing that that's the battle flag of chemistry that's the uh, the whole subject of chemistry is involved with that periodic table well we have a different periodic table at a scale much much finer than the chemical scale and that is this the uh, the, the fundamental particles and we now know that the neutrino there is the there is uh, this the standard model uh, has uh, uh, electrons, muons, and taus, leptons, and then it has uh, the heavier particles, uh, the strange qu quarks, the stra charm quark, the strange quark, uh, and in a pattern. And that's like a periodic table. In other words, everything we have, everything we know about in matter, is composed of various components of that standard model, providing you know. Uh, not only the the properties of the particles, but their social behavior. You know, how does the muon uh, <laughs> behave compared to the tau, or uh, how does a top quark behave compared to the bottom quark? We have these funny names for things, but uh, but uh, the standard model is a very powerful summary of uh, of nature, and uh, we're. Uh, <laughs> I could say we're charmed by this because there's a charm quark <laughs> too, but uh, today uh, we're left with this standard model and some very, very mysterious puzzles. So I, I think, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we try to, in the U.S., to build a, a particle accelerator that would address these puzzles. Uh, it was canceled by Congress 
1993 for reasons which are complicated and probably not worth going into. Uh, and then the Europeans uh, led in the construction of a new accelerator and the, the U.S. and all the other major nations contributed to this, so it's a world collaboration. It's being built in Switzerland, and uh, it uh, turned on uh, six or seven months ago and then had some, some difficulties, and we expect it to start up again in, within the next few months, and yet it'll take another year or so for, to become familiar with this huge machine, very huge, very expensive machine, but the whole world of uh, industrial nations that are interested in science have contributed to this. So we expect that some of our puzzles will be solved when this machine really gets going and, and begins to explore, you know, parts of nature that have not yet been explored. But before we talk about uh, uh, your work uh, uh, in trying to uh, uh, transform science education for young people, I, I have a question because uh, an important uh, uh, period in your career is you were director of uh, the Fermi uh, Lab. And, and I'm curious about what from that experience you learned about, you know, organizing big science because, you know, as we face challenges such as the environment and so on, we, we're going to have to be thinking about science at the strategic level. Do you have any insights that, that well, come from that experience? Uh, a lot. I mean, uh, this, is, this is big science. In other words, it's big, expensive science. It involves large machines. Uh, we're, uh, we're comfortable with a notion that when we do big science, there are byproducts of this that are societally very beneficial. And so there are many, many examples where the uh, quest for understanding uh, in an abstract way gives rise to very useful uh, offshoots or, and, uh, um, and a, a broadening of our deep knowledge of things which have to do with health, almost anything you want to do with human activity. So we're, we're confident that, that research pays in some sense even though it may sound to be very abstract. Uh, yet, uh, today, if you uh, uh, got up on a platform and said, uh, yeah, we really have to build some XYZ machine, uh, you would probably be ushered out because this is a, a time of economic chaos and environmental catastrophe and all kinds of problems we have, health care, uh, many, many issues that uh, our government is facing that uh, require a lot of attention. Uh, nevertheless, in spite of that, uh, many of us feel that ultimately uh, both science and education are essential features in getting out of this problem. Because if you make a list of all of the problems uh, that our president is facing and that our Congress is facing and make a list, uh, you begin to see that addressing those problems is going to require scientific knowledge, scientific wisdom, engineering uh, wisdom, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, understanding. Uh, so we, we can't give up on our uh, quest for understanding of how nature works and, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the process of uh, of understanding the world. And, and today, there are some mysteries that come from the thing you raised earlier, co the cosmology. Cosmology, there's a, at Fermilab, when I was the director, I started a cosmology group, and it became one of the more powerful groups uh, in the nation in which cosmology uh, plays a role uh, in, the, in the macroscopic world of galaxies, of trillions and trillions of miles across uh, to the microscopic world of, uh, of uh, subnuclear particles. It's, you know, it's, the, it's the, uh, uh, the big and the small combined in many ways. And uh, so we're, we're, we're um, uh, very anxious to continue our uh, 
our research. We don't want to stop research because uh, there are too many things that will come out of it that will be useful. And of course, direct research on environmental energy sources is crucial. We know that many things we know what to do and other things we don't know what to do. And so we just let curiosity play a role and we follow that in the best way we can. Uh, let's talk now about the, the, the need to revise the curriculum to change our public schools so we can create another generation of scientists like yours. You're, you're a, cr a critic uh, of the, the current curriculum. What's wrong with it uh, and what are the difficulties in changing it? Well, our curriculum is, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it was designed in 1890-something and uh, as a, uh, which was perfectly okay in 1890 <laughs> to uh, teach biology and uh, after biology, chemistry, and after chemistry, physics. It's alphabetically okay, uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, in 1890 that was okay, but in 1930s we made major discoveries which show that chemistry and physics are closely allied, that there is no phenomenon in chemistry that doesn't require an explanation which goes to your knowledge of physics. And the same thing with biology. Biology now is the most complicated of all subjects. And uh, therefore, it should wait for, your no for a, an understanding of physics and chemistry before you tackle the big subject of biology and life and processes of that kind. But our schools are not adapting to it. Uh, the old uh, uh, criterion of starting in ninth grade with biology, then going to chemistry, and then going to physics is, uh, in, in the U.S., is done in 92% um, or some number like that of, of all our schools. And it's out of date. It's uh, wrong. It doesn't take into account all of the knowledge we've gained in the uh, 20th century about chemistry, physics, and biology. They are connected subjects now, and we have to teach them that way. Our schools are failing to produce, uh, not only failing to produce the kind of quality and number of, of dedicated scientists. To me, I'm more worried about the ignorance of the general public. What we need is public science literacy. We need the public to have some grasp, not to be scientists, but to have a grasp of how science works because they're going to vote, they're going to elect, uh, they're going to, uh, the government is going to seek their approval for lots of things. Do we need more nuclear weapons today or maybe we don't need any that we have now? You know, there are many issues in which you need a public science literacy and we don't have it. We're not producing it in the high schools. We're not producing it in the colleges. And I particularly find fault with the universities who have a responsibility for producing educated citizens. But an educated citizen has to have a grasp of what science is, what science can do, what science cannot do. And that's where we're failing. Uh, the changes uh, you were suggesting yesterday in your lecture uh, that are required. One, one is really involved in, in changing the role of the teacher. When, when I grew up, uh, uh, one, the teacher was an authority figure who passed on, this is, th this is the information that we have. And, and you're suggesting really, we've got to really overhaul that notion of the teacher. Well, yes, I think, uh, I mean, in the, way, the way I put it is you wake up one morning and you're the president of the United right. States and you won on a mandate of fixing education. And the Pentagon doesn't know what to do with all the money, so you have uh, infinite resources. What do you do? The first thing usually you do is you look at the, the teacher core, and there are some wonderful teachers around. But the teacher education is essentially poorly done. And teachers are not well-educated, in, especially in mathematics and science. So you look at primary school teachers, uh, it's a disaster. And it's not only in the U.S. In most countries, primary school teachers are not trained in math and science, and yet small children are eager 
to know and learn uh, and and enjoy uh, the the beauty and the fun and of of mathematics and science. It's supposed to be a, a glorious activity. It should be fun. Teachers don't see that. They're not trained well enough, especially primary school teachers. So teacher education becomes a major thing. And teacher, it's not only uh, the pay of teachers which is inadequate, but it's the social status of teachers which is inadequate. So we have to pay attention to to respect of teachers. You know, in Germany, I think a, a, a kindergarten teaches a Frau Professor. We have to give teachers, and teachers have to earn respect. And uh, that doesn't happen. I've seen, often I'd sit in a classroom after discussing something with a teacher, and just as she erases the blackboard, out comes a loudspeaker saying, all teachers hand in their, their attendance summary. How dare you interrupt the teacher in the holy moment of teaching for some stupidity, administrative stupidity. So it, it shows a lack of, of the kind of respect we have to have for our teachers. We have, they, have to earn, they have to earn it, but they have to have that respect. They have to have the remuneration. We have to look carefully at present high school students for potential teachers and glamorize the teachers and make more movies about teachers like famous movie Dead Poets Society. We have to, you know, en embroil the media in elevating the task of teaching because that's so crucial to improving your educational system and our system isn't working. Uh, a third point that I heard you making is uh, that we, we have to refigure uh, how we teach science and in a way draw in the humanities in, in a way. Uh, uh, and and I, I think you're suggesting that storytelling, stories, uh, what, what, what we think of with, you know, in the literature courses, in a way have to be brought into science. So scientists become attractive, their stories become attractive, the steps in their, in their doing their work become important. Yeah, I, I think the key word is process. Right now, uh, when we teach science, let's say even a reasonably good teacher, and maybe it's ninth grade, tenth grade, uh, the content of science is taught. So you learn about velocity and acceleration and uh, momentum and energy, all these things that have to do with the content. But there's another aspect to science, and that's even more important if we're thinking not about future scientists as much as by f uh, future citizens, future family members who have to make decisions, future voters who have to make decisions. For that, we need to teach what is science? How does it work? Does it ever go wrong? If it goes wrong, how do we fix it? There are many questions that have to do with the process of science rather than the content of science or in addition to the content of science. So my strong feeling is that, uh, that we sacrifice maybe 20% or maybe 30% of content for process, for telling stories about how science works, how we made discoveries, uh, what is a scientist, how do, they, how do they grow, how do they behave, uh, what makes exciting science, is science ever wrong? If it's wrong, how do we fix it? Many, many issues that have to do with, with the process of science is part of being educated. So I'm shocked when col college presidents uh, decide that the science requirement for this college will be a semester of what they call rocks for jocks or some mm -hmm. uh, other you know, non-serious way. I actually believe that um, University of Chicago, which is probably more advanced than most, requires two full years of science for all its graduates. You don't graduate from the University of Chicago without two full years of science, one in, in biological sciences, the other in physical sciences with laboratory. And even that may not be enough to produce what you would call an educated citizen who can participate in many decisions. Now again, if you go back and look at all the problems poor Mr. Obama is mm -hmm. facing, all those problems have a science side. It's not that science can fix all the problems, but they're, 
but the knowledge of science is crucial to uh, these environmental catastrophe we're facing, to, to the, uh, uh, even to the uh, failure of, e of our economy. And you look one after another at these problems, and they all, they're not all fixed by science, but they are all have a, a role, science has a role to play in repairing our society. And I think our education system is not up to it. That's what we have to do. We have to really begin to say that, uh, that we need a total, not uh, reform, but transformation of, of the way we teach. Uh, in your work, and just talking uh, with you about your career, one has the sense that you have, you develop in your work a sense of the particular, the, the little thing that you have to do, but also at the same time a sense of the big picture in science. I'm curious, when you look at the educational system, do we fix the whole thing at once, or <laughs> is it a step-by-step -step process, and if so, what is the first step? Now, now you're over my salary level. <laughs> I see. I mean, okay. It's, it, it, uh, we had uh, we had some ideas about what to do. Clearly, if you look at our system, you see where it's wrong. We have 50 states. We have uh, 16,000 school districts and very little communication between different parts of the country. I mean, does New Jersey know what Montana is doing? And if a poor teacher goes from one to another, does she have to learn a new language? You know, we, we have this incoherent uh, array of things. Now, I do believe that local participation is very important. You just can't shut out the parents and the local uh, people. In, but that doesn't mean that you can't have good, better communication. I think the states have to organize themselves. I think the business community is, should play an extremely important role in uh, unifying the different state uh, a a activities. There's a business higher education roundtable that issues papers. There's an enormous amount of literature out there telling us what's wrong with our educational system and how to fix it. What's missing, what's missing is a mechanism for implementing all the good ideas that are out there. We don't have, we're missing an implementation structure and that's that's very important remember when uh, Sputnik well we had a, a crisis in Sputnik and we needed a an organization that could uh, uh, allow us to compete with the Soviets in space it was called NASA so we created NASA before it existed we needed that in the same way now I think we need an organization a compact uh, not administrative, but really uh, philosophical group mm -hmm. that looks at the needs of our educational system and does all the propaganda, gets the media involved, gets the public involved. We've got to have an Oprah Winfrey type of, mm -hmm. of uh, support system from the public. If the, if the public is not joining into this revolution, it won't work. We've got to get the public, we've got to explain to the general public why it's so important that our educational system be brought into the 21st century. That's where we are. One final question. Uh, looking back on your career, is there uh, a piece of advice, one piece of advice that you would give students out there who might want to become scientists or citizens out there who want to become more scientifically informed? Well, I think, I think the advice is I think that uh, the public has to be aware of the problem and the public has to be realistic. I mean too often parents uh, charge in to, uh, uh, without uh, knowing enough about what, what it is that has to be done and I've seen this uh, sometimes uh, with disastrous results. So we, we need a, a, a sympathetic public and what we need is leading citizens that might uh, take, you know, uh, 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 advise and lead and, and uh, cajole and so on because if the public really gets upset now and begins to understand the repercussions of a failed education system uh, and, and the, the, the things we have to do to fix it, uh, if they don't get involved in this, nothing will happen. So we need public leadership, people who can lead and, you know, and 
certainly uh, we've never been in, in my memory as well off as we are now in Washington with uh, gifted leadership. But unfortunately, we have so many problems, one on top of the other, that uh, that, that may frustrate uh, the great power that we now, in principle, could bring to bear on the problem. And what about advice to students who want to be scientists? Well, that's, uh, it's a wonderful career. I mean, you, it's uh, the main thing about science that people ought to be aware of is how much fun it is and how beautiful it is. And, and uh, the joy of doing science is something that uh, more scientists should not be embarrassed about extolling. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's, uh, sometimes you're, you're looking for somebody in a, in a science building and there's noise and you suddenly realize there are three or four scientists, they're rolling on the floor laughing. Why are they <laughs> laughing? Well, uh, they just worked for three years on some subject and they couldn't solve it and then all of a sudden they solved it and the solution was so simple and so beautiful that they just burst into laughter. I think that's, that joy of science is there. If you work at it, it's fun, it's beautiful, and it's profitable. Dr. Letterman, I, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to uh, share your experiences with us today. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.